Now, mass spectrometry is a really interesting topic, right? Um, notice a lot of persons tend not to gravitate to the topic itself. But it has a couple of basic um, tenets that we have to understand. And once we understand that everything else is really um, trial and error, learning how to really um, read the different stuff, how to calculate our different masses for our different ions, right? And that is really through practice. Same thing like IR, it is uh, you have a couple rules and then you have to actually practice to get a hang of it. You can't just study it one day and then automatically you know how to read every spec. That's not how it works, right? So you're gonna need to actually practice it, okay? So let's go through the basic terms, right? And have a look at some of the different. Um, data that we can have all right so before we enter this powerpoint really could someone just let me know what it is what mass spectrometry is about what is it really why are we looking at it sir it's like to if you find a uh, element and you need to know the atomic mass you'd use the mass spectrometry method to find it all right so we can use that method to find it all right any other use any other reason why we're looking at this sir can you repeat the question please why are we looking at mass spectrometry or i could ask a simpler question what is it about what is it used for you can answer any of those so I think you use mass spec to um to figure out the I think I used to figure out the compound you're trying to find. Like let's say you know it's ethanol, but you don't know which ethanol it is. And I think your the the plus one P will give you the answer or something like that. Interesting. All right. Okay, 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 okay. All right. I understand what you're saying. So it's used to identify these unknown substances. All right. So you can use it. Um, we can break these compounds themselves into these respective ions and study how you know those ions relate to specific masses and piece together a big picture of what the compound actually is or what the rather the molecule actually is all right so mass spectrometry is just another type of method used in ad analysis right and it is one of the most accurate methods okay so some of our objectives for this afternoon right we must be able to explain the basic principles of mass spectrometry and this is rooted in electromagnetism this is basic physics right then explain the significance of the m plus one peak in mass spectra we must be able to use mass spectral data to determine the relative isotopic masses and relative isotopic abundances right of specific isotopes distinguish between molecules of similar relative molecular masses and be able to predict possible identities of simple organic molecules based on their fragmentation patterns right so this is what we must be able to do, okay? The last three, right, or well, number three, the use of them using the spectral data, this takes practice, right? So I'll go through the basic tenants, right? And trust in the fact that you guys will actually practice some of these to hone the skills, all right? So the key points, right? It's principles of mass spectral, right? We need to understand that. We need to understand, right, um, how a sample itself shows um, a plot of relative, is right, relative isotopic mass and relative abundance, right? And we meet, We actually need to understand how to interpret the plot as well, as it relates to just the abundance of the isotopes and the mass charge ratio, right? Mass charge ratio. So we've looked at that um, a little bit in Unit One Chemistry, right? Relative atomic mass is the weighted mean of the isotopic masses, 
right? That's one important point that we have to note as well. And high resolution mass spectrometry can distinguish between molecules with similar relative molecular masses, all right? So just some key things to keep in mind when we're going through this topic, all right? So let's have a go into this. An overview. So mass spectrometry really, as I stated before, is a really, really accurate method of determining molecular mass of a compound and its elemental composition. So once we use presumptive methods, right, in order to figure out whether or not something is present within a molecule, we can use mass spectrometry, right, to actually piece together the actual elemental composition of said molecule, right? So it is the most accurate method right, for determining these things. So in this technique, what we do is bombard molecules with beams of electro of energetic electrons, right? So we can use photons, these are electron beams themselves, right? We ionize these molecules, right? And when they're ionized, they're broken up into many different fragments, right? Some of which are positive ions, right? So each kind of the ion has a particular ratio, mass to charge ratio that we can look at, right? And if we can simplify it to the, the most basic terms, what we're saying is that when we break it to a fragment, we look at the mass of the fragment, right? So for most ions, the charge is one and thus the mass charge ratio is simply the mo molecular mass of the ion, right? So mostly what we're going to be looking at in Cape chemistry would be just um, ions that just have a plus one charge, right? So we're just going to be looking at roughly the molecular mass of the ions. Right, basically. So the basic principle of mass spectrometry, right, is that mass spectrometry produces multiple ions from the analyte in the sample being examined, right? It then splits them according to their specific mass to charge ratio, right? And then records the relative abundance of each ion type. That's what it's doing, right? It takes some things, chops it up, right? And then we re read and record, right? the mass of each of those fragments. That's what it is, right? So the process itself there, though, right? The main stages are vaporization, ionization, acceleration, deflection, and detection, right? Some of these things need to remember them, all right? So first we have to vaporize the sample. Why do we vaporize the sample? Could anyone let me know why? Why do we vaporize the sample? So it's easier to ionize. So it's easier to ionize. Lovely. And could somebody define um, ionization in and of itself? What is ionization? Therapy. What is ionization? So we're saying that it's easier to ionize when we vaporize a substance. What is ionization? You could relate it to the definition of ionization energy. So what is ionization? When you lose electrons, or you gain it. All right, so ionization energies, right, or ionization generally speaks about the fact that one mole of electrons are removed from one mole of gaseous ions, or, or gaseous elements, gaseous atoms rather, right? So one mole of electrons are removed from one mole of gaseous atoms, right? And we tend to vaporize these things, right, into gases, so ionization can, well, so we can have an ease of ionization, right? So we can apply the respective energies in order to ionize the substances, right? So yeah, we have the substance, we vaporize it, then we ionize it, right? So the high electron beams, right, from the cathode ray, right, would collide with the atoms and molecules of the sample and knock out one or more of the electrons from the sample, right? So positive ions are formed. Lovely. Ions are accelerated by an electric field, right? So we're going to be applying an electric and a magnetic field to the samples themselves, 
right? And the electromagnetic force itself will accelerate the particles in a specific direction. In order to note that direction, you could use the left, the right hand rule or whatever, right? That's physics, right? So you can understand it through that standpoint, right? So once we have a charged particle, particle itself, it can be accelerated using an electromagnetic field. And that's what we use, right? It's a magnetic field that deflects it, right? So what we're doing, we're accelerating the charge the charged particle, right? Through an electric field, and then it is bent and deflected, right, by a magnetic field, right? So the particle itself is going to move, be moving in the direction of the electric force, right? And then we know that the electric force, right, um, usually or commonly is perpendicular to the magnetic force. So after it goes to the electric field, it's accelerated, being pushed by that force, and the magnetic field would deflect the so the species itself, right? So we're gonna have ionic deflection by the magnetic field, right? And then the ions themselves are detected and recorded on a detector. Alright? So we have vaporization of the sample specifically, right? Ionization by a cathode ray. Well, commonly by a cathode ray. Then we're gonna have acceleration through an electric field, deflection through a magnetic field, and then we're gonna have the detection, right? And, it, and after it detects everything it is recorded and a graph is presented all right so that's what's happening everybody's fine so far all right hoping that everyone is good let me just put on my glasses so i can look at this fine where it's here all right so the mass spectrometer we spoke about it gradually already right so for a given electric and magnetic field, only those ions with a particular charge and mass will hit the detector, right? So there are some ions and there are some fragments themselves that are not too important, right? Or we could set the magnetic field and electric field of the substances, right? Well, not of the substance, of the machine itself, right? Um, to work with a particular range of substances, right? So we can note that the electric and magnetic field O works really only for those ions with a particular charge and mass, right? By gradually increasing the strength of the magnetic field, the ions of increasing mass charge ratio will hit the detector, right? So if you're going to really be detecting um, something large, right? Like an isobutyl substituent or something like that, right? Then you're going to have to have a large magnetic field right in order for that magnetic field force to be able to deflect right the substituents right or deflect the fragments right onto the detector right so we have to continually increase the strength of the magnetic field for certain ions right so the figure the example there on the right um we have a green line that represents the ion with a mass to charge ratio of 15. so let me just get the highlight the pointer right so this green line going down the center would represent that mass charge ratio of 15, right? An ion heavier than this, which would be pro probably example 16, would be deflected or bent less, right? So the red line is basically what we can use to highlight that, right? So if, if the green line itself, right, would be a mass charge ratio of 15, right? The larger the ion itself or the larger the fragment, the less the deflection, right? And then the lighter the fragment, the more the deflection. We looked at this through a mass spectrometer already with respect to the fundamental particles back in module one, unit, unit one, right? But with this now, we're just looking at the molecular ions themselves, right? So if the ion is doubly charged, right, it is deflected twice as much. So for example, if you're going to have lead 208, right, that ion itself has a mass charge ratio of 208, um, so a lead 208 2 plus right ion has a mass charge ratio of 104 right so what we're going to be looking at is the fact that the mass to charge ratio itself right has an effect on how much the ion itself is bent within the mass spectrometer right so if it has a 2 plus charge right it's going to have that ratio if it is a 3 plus charge, it's going to divide that ratio by 3, right? But luckily for Cape Chemistry, we keep it 
at the most basic level ever, we only deal with plus one charge for the most point, right? For the most point. So let's have a look at this now. Wait, before we move on to looking at the difference um, data, is everybody okay so far as it relates to how a mass spectrometer works? Is that fine? All right, so I'm gonna repeat myself again. If there are any issues at all, or any questions, you can just ask. All right, sir. How, sir? How does the, the um, I don't know. It makes sense, but like I don't think I understand it to the you know maximal detail. Okay, how? Okay, ask a question. Then. What's the question that you need to ask? All right, so say you have a sample, right? And you're trying to find, um, I don't even know, uh, magnesium. And it's inside of an ore, or it's inside of a, it has like impurities on it. How would, how would like the whole process work to like find how much magnesium is in it? To find how much magnesium is in the product itself. Mm. That's interesting. All right, so you're looking at a quantitative process itself, right? The mass spectrum spectrometer itself is usually used to detect um, the samples, right? Um, the structural, um, well, the structure rather, of a sample itself. So we're looking at what the structure is in and of itself, right? And not necessarily how much of it is there. Um, because if you're going to look at a quantitative method like that, Right, looking at how much of a sample is present or the concentration of a sample itself right that is where that is where we're gonna look at some ir or uv spec or gravimetry or something like that you if it's an ionic compound like magnesium as you stated it would probably grab the gravimetry right but what we're looking at is if you're speaking about on the magnesium containing compound right um what the mass spectrometer would do is figure out what the structure of that compound is rather than figure out how much of it is present oh so it would be like if you had some um like material and you didn't know what was in it you'd be able to find out if there's magnesium in it using it you'll be able to find if there magnesium is if magnesium is in it right but you won't know how much of it is there you just know that that much that magnesium is there. All right, yeah, that makes sense. And then we can use gravimetry or some other processes, right, to figure out how much magnesium is there. All right, and then you can use different types of separatory um, methods to purify the magnesium and then figure out how much is there. All right, but here we're just looking at the defining the structure of us of a given molecule. All right. So let's look at two pentanone here. All right, we have the relative intensity or the relative abundance, right, of there on the y-axis, and then on the x-axis we have the mass charge ratio. Now note that we're we're speaking to at this level things with just a plus one charge. Therefore, it's the mass charge ratio really translate directly into the mass of the thing itself, right? So the mass spectrum of two pentanone is shown. Um, showing the relative intensity of each peak and the mass to charge ratio, right? That is what's shown here. So you can see the isotope peak, right? Which is the molecular ion or the parent ion peak. We're going to speak about what those are, right? And we're seeing here that we have lost one electron here, right? From the oxygen there, right? And then in another peak itself, when we lose another another electron, right, and we also lose a methyl substituent, right, itself, we have a peak of 15, right, mass 15 here, right, and then we have um, a peak of 28 here, then 43, the highest peak is the base peak, right, what we're going to be doing is actually looking at how we read these different peaks and what they actually mean, all right. So what this is talking about here, we're looking at the masses, right, of these different substituents. And the M-15 peak and the N-28 peak 
means that this molecule itself m has lost an ad, atomic um unit right or an amu of 15 right m minus 28 means that the molecule itself lost amu 28 right or 28 amus right and here the molecule itself lost 43 amus what does this mean it means that for each fragment it is losing right we take the mass of that fragment and minus it from the original um molecule itself right so we have a m plus p speaking about the Sir, could you repeat that, that please all right so what we're saying is that for these peaks here that we see m minus 15 m minus 28 right what we're basically doing is looking at the molecule itself right looking at the fact that this specific ion right has lost a methyl group right and then we can calculate the mass of a methyl group a methyl group is what a methyl group is ch3 yes Yes or no? Yes, sir. All right. So C is 12 and H is 1. Therefore, it has lost 15 atomic mass units, right? So this is the M minus 15 peak that we're seeing here, right? Noting that it has lost 15, right? Out of its weight specifically, right? So it lost a one carbon and three hydrogen. So it's the molecule itself minus that 15 that it lost, if that makes sense. And it's the same thing for here, right? We're looking at the ion itself, right? We note that this ion has lost 28. So we look at the pentanone and we take off, right? The equivalent atoms that would add up to 28. And then that ion here will be present at this peak, right? And then here we have the base peak, right, itself, which has the highest abundance itself, right? And this has lost 43 atomic um, units, right? AMUs, atomic mass units. But we're going to be speaking about what these mean and what, why is it important at all, right? But this is just the first graph that we're looking at. We have many more graphs in this PowerPoint to look at, many more, right? So let's have a look. All right. So first of all, the relative atomic masses, we have been treated with relative atomic masses since fourth form, right? So let's have a look at it again. The mass spectra can be used to identify the different isotopes present in an element. Now that we're looking at masses, we must note that all the other elements, majority of these elements have different isotopes, right? So we have different types of isotopes, for example, hydrogen 1 hydrogen 2 and hydrogen 3 carbon 14 carbon 13 carbon 12 right we have oxygen 16 oxygen 17 we have all different types of isotopes therefore right when there are discrepancies within our masses we can probably assume that an isotope is throwing off the thing itself right and this is this is another important thing to note uh, um to the accuracy of mass spec right because in uv spec and ir spec and all different types of um spectros spectroscopic methods right we can note the structure right we can figure out slightly what is present within the molecules themselves right but we won't know the specific right structure itself right so we can figure out that yeah men like methane is present right but it could be a methane that possesses carbon 13 right and a deuterium atom and a regular hydrogen atom right so it can specify the different isotopes that are present within the molecule right so different isotopes are detected with a particular whole number um mass charge ratio because each proton and neutron has a relative atomic mass of one so the simplest way to do it step one we multiply each isotopic mass by the percentage abundance right step two we add the figures together and step three we divide by a hundred we have been doing this for a while in chemistry right so an example of how it is done is here finding the relative atomic abund well the relative abundance right of germanium so what we look at we're taking the mass and the abundance, we're timesing them together, we add everything and divide by 100 in order to give us the percentage abundance of our germanium at all. Right? We just use the example germanium. Okay? So, the example is there to, to basically 
explain how this is done again just to reiterate to you how this is done all right so questions like these may pop up but they are on the easier side of mass spec okay all right so let's just move on to the next slide if there are no questions or concerns with this information here all right so this is just some practice uh, if you would like to practice it right the answer is already there so you can figure out whether or not you get the actual answer that should be provided so if you want to try it you can just screenshot it and go ahead right and as i'm always saying you can always provide the answer to me in my inbox right on whatsapp or send it in the group it's fine all right but this is just some practice with your isotopic abundance in order to find your relative atomic mass all right Okay, so moving onwards. Are there any questions or concerns yet? All right, it seems like they're done. Okay. Yeah. All right, no problem. So let's have a look at this. Molecular mass is from spe mass spectra, right? The mass spectrum of chlorine, we're just having a look at chlorine. Hold on. Give me one moment. Let me have a look at this because this has an M2 plus P. That seems like information that should not be here in the slide. Because this looks like it jumped too complex too quick. Yeah. Alright, so let's just have a look at this. <laughs> right, it's not actually looking at a chlorine containing compound, but chlorine itself. So let's look at the mass spectrum of chlorine. Alright, our diatomic chlorine. So the mass spectrum of chlorine shows peaks due to singly charged. Um, ions, chlorine 35 and chlorine 37, isotopes at 35 and 37 respectively, right? So you can see isotope at 35 and isotope at 37. Let me include the laser pointer, all right? It's 35, 37, right? The spectrum will show small peaks at 17.5, right? And at 18.5, which are due to doubly charged ions, right? So remember, if the charge on the ion is double, is doubled, right? Meaning that it's from plus one to plus two, what it will do is half the mass to charge ratio, right? Remember, the mass is divided by the charge, right? That's why it's M slash Z. So if we have a mass of 35 and the charge is plus one, then it's 35 over one, which is 35. But if it is a two plus no, then it's gonna be 35 divided by two, right? So 17.5. Right, so notice if we have a doubly charged, um, ions are usually found closer to zero there about, right? Because we're gonna start to divide by two, then divide by three, then divide by four, etc., going closer and closer to zero. Obviously, it will never be zero, so it will approach infinity. We're not gonna talk about that right now, but let's just look at it simply, right? We're gonna have two different isotopes, 35 and 37, right? And then some other peaks down here just basically speaks to chlorine 35 and chlorine 37 that have more than a plus one charge. Okay, so the spectrum shows peaks caused by ionized chlorine molecules, so Cl2+, right? As shown on the spectrum to the right, well, it should, it's on the, in this case, on the left, right? There are three peaks of these um, molecular ions themselves, right? So let's look at this. So at 70, right, 70 is due to this molecular ion, right? 72 is shown by this molecular ion, and 73 is shown by... Was well, 74 actually is shown by this molecular ion, right? So the smallest ion, molecular ion peak here is chlorine 37 bonded to chlorine 37. All right, and then the other one is chlorine 35 bonded to chlorine 37, and then the largest one is chlorine 35 bonded to chlorine 35, right? Why are these peaks at different heights? Could anybody tell me why? Why is chlorine 35 um, molecule, right? Why is it higher than chlorine 35, 37 molecule? And why is that still higher than the chlorine 37 molecule? Why is that telling us? That is more stable. Not only is it more stable, right? But there's an A word. That one of these isotopes are more, so, more abundant. Lovely, right? So it is more stable, you know, because in order for something to be more abundant, it means it must be more stable, right? So the chlorine-35 molecule is more abundant than the others, 
right? It's the same thing for the current 35 ion, which is more abundant than the current 37 ion, right? So hopefully everybody understands how to interpret the spectra using this type of information. Are we following? Drop a one in the chat if we're following, please. Let me know if I lost you along the way. All right. So everything should be fine thus far. So the base peak itself, right? This is the peak with the highest relative abundance, right? So the base peak is the peak with the highest relative abundance, right? From the most stable ion in the chamber assigned a value of 100, all other peaks are given values relative to this, right? So the most stable peak is given that value of 100, and all other peaks are relative to this peak. So the peak itself with the highest, right? Relative abundance, that is our base peak. So we can note that that would be the base peak. So this here would be the base peak. Base peak. Right? That's the base peak there. Looking at the molecular ion peak now, the molecular ion peak is the point with the largest mass to charge ratio, right? After excluding any peaks induced by the existence of heavier isotopes. What does that mean? If we're going to have a heavier isotope, obviously, right, it will have a larger mass to charge ratio, right? But we're going to exclude all exist existence of heavier isotopes, right? So isotopes that are not likely to be formed or that, that are not likely detected on the detector, right, that those won't generally be included in the graphs given to you, right? Well, I'm including that information there, right? But usually, the molecular ion peak is the one with the largest mass charge, mass to charge ratio, right? The ion produced from the removal of just one electron gives a mass equal to the RMM of the compound and is known as a molecular ion peak, right? So our molecular ion peak here would be here, right? So this is our parent ion peak or our M plus peak or our molecular ion peak. So you could call it the molecular ion peak, the M plus peak, or the parent ion peak, right? So that just speaks to the peak that is produced from the ion, right, of the component itself that occurs when one electron is removed, right? So it would still have this equal, equal mass, right, relatively equal mass, right, of the regular molecule. Because if we remove the electron, that doesn't really change the mass much. It doesn't change the mass that much. So you can just say it's equal to relative molecular mass. Alright? So since it's going to be negligible in our case, it's just equal there. Right? So it's usually the one that's furthest right as well. Right? So usually the peak that is furthest to the right is the molecular ion peak. And then the largest peak there on the graph is the base peak. Alright? Any questions? Any concerns? But uh, sir, uh, on some on some of these, you see like the M plus one peak and stuff like that. So like, how is there? Isn't it supposed to be the one that's most to the right since it's the one with the highest mass to charge ratio? Okay, you're saying that on some graphs there is a peak further than the M plus one peak. Well, yeah, there's like the M plus two and things like that. There's like ones with higher mass to charge ratios. All right. So that tends to occur, right? Okay, it does occur. It is possible. But we're looking at the M plus peak, right? These are for the different compounds that just provide this um, regular molecular ion. Right? We're going to be looking at how M plus 2 peaks this. So, right? But when we get there, we're going to compare it to this. Right? So let's just build on the information going forward. Right? So it, it clearly states to me that you have done the topic before. So we're going to have a look at it. All right. So M plus 2 peak, it will be found further. All right. But let's have a look at the rest of the information. And then we'll relate it to M plus 2 peak. And then we get back here and then look at the difference between M plus and M plus 2. There is somebody in the chat asked if you could go over the last point. Last slide. This slide? Here, let me just ask. Finish with this one. If I could go over the last point so the ion produced from the removal of just one electron okay 
so what we're saying is that if we have compound a right the compound a let's say that compound a has a relative molecular mass of one right it will show up as a m plus one t right well it will show up as a m at a m peak right so the molecule itself will be present right that's what it is right but let's say that we threw it we bring it through a mass spectrometer right we actually remove an electron from it right then that compound a itself right will still have a relative molecular mass of one right so what we're saying is that if we remove an electron that doesn't drastically change the mass of the compound itself right so what the m plus peak is just literally showing you the molecule with a plus charge right so the molecule with one electron removed and that is what the m plus peak is showing us right so it's just showing us right a little peak at where the relative molecular mass of the compound is u is right and that would just be with the compound itself that lost an electron all right so it's generation of the of what the compound is a generalization of what the compound is um the heaviest ion right yes would be it's the heaviest ion would be basically what the compound is or what the mass of the compound is all right but for it to be detected right we have to remove an electron right remember we have to accelerate it through an electric field and deflect it using a magnetic field this only occurs with charged particles therefore we need to ionize the substance right so when we do that now then we can detect that and that is really a generalization of what the compound is that's what the m plus peak is right so you can generally say that that was that is what the compound is because losing one electron won't really affect the relative molecular mass that much all right is that fine okay so the mass spectra of compounds now right in many compounds relative abundance of the molecular ion peak is usually low right so it's usually low so sometimes you're gonna have this, this little tiny peak right usually usually small this occurs because the molecule breaks up in the mass spectrometer to form fragments having a particular mass to charge ratio this process is called fragmentation right so when the molecule breaks up in the spectrometer to form fragments that is called fragmentation the formation of fragments fine right fragmentation generally occurs where the bonds are weakest and that's important when we start to look at the graphs of a ketone and an aldehyde we can see where the where the fragments are likely to be formed because some parts of the molecule are less likely to break than others simple right and we spoke about bond strength and those type of things in unit one so we're going to bring back that concept right the more stable the fragment the greater is its abundance in the mass spectrum right so the base peak now, note that the base peak has the highest abundance. That means that it's the most stable fragment. So I want us to connect information together in a long chain while we move on, right? Tertiary carbocations tend to be more stable than secondary carbocations, and secondary carbocations tend to be more stable than primary carbocations. So that is another thing that is shown here now, right? So if you look at this uh, mass spectrum of propanone, right, we can see the fact but well, we can see right the different types of ions that are produced here right so the large peaks at 15 and 43 right those mass to charge ratios right are um are present here so the peak at 15 is due to the ion here right so the methyl radical well it's not a methyl radical the methyl ion here right and then the peak at 43 is due to this ion present Right, the CH3 CO um, ion. The base peak is 43 and the molecular ion peak is 58. Right? So you can see this molecular ion peak over here. Alright. So in the case of CAPE, they tend to give you a ballpark for a compound. Right? So they might tell you that okay, an alkene of of such relative of um relative molecular mass, right, is put into a mass spectrum, identify the structure of the alkane at the base peak or identify the structure of the alkane at the peak 43 or 35 or something like that right so it gives you a general ballpark of the compound itself right so you will have a general understanding of what the molecular ion peak should be right there are tinier peaks after the molecular ion peak itself right 
right they can be described as m plus two peaks depending on the compound itself right but if we get a ballpark for the compound we must know that the molecular ion peak would be the mass of the compound itself right so we must be able to label that all right so it's usually the most abundant um, peak that is on the right side of the graph and we're gonna have a look at many other types of graphs all right so let's look at pentane here the relative abundance of, um onto the mass charge ratio for pentane itself the base peak right of a mass charge ratio of 30 of 40 feet rather in the mass spectrum of pentane indicates a preference for the c2 to c3 fragmentation what does that mean so if we fragment a molecule right so this molecule itself has a mass charge ratio of 72 all fragments or originate from this molecular ion so this is the molecular ion that is present at the m plus peak here right so all of the fragmentation to the left of this peak is formed from this molecular ion so we're looking at the pentanyl well not the pentanyl but the the pentane ion right so we're looking at this all right so if we break it in a, in different positions we're gonna have different types of ions being produced right so if we were to break the ion here so let me have a look at this if we were to break the ion here itself right we would actually produce um something different right we can actually produce um this here give me a second let me clear that out mm. Let me use my finger then since I don't have my pen with me right now to clarify this. All right, so what we're seeing is that we're breaking the different mo molecules, right? So if we're looking at this ion, this ion is actually, a, um, it has a radical, right? So if we break it at one and two, between one and two here, right? What we're going to end up with, right? Is a methyl ion, right? And then the rest of a butyl ion. Right? And that is what we can see here. Right? If we were to break it between carbon 2 and carbon 3, right, what are we going to get there? We're going to get an ethyl ion, right, and a propyl ion. Right? If we're going to break it between 4 and 5, what we're going to get is that ethyl, ra is that um, methyl radical, right, and a butyl ion. And if we're going to break it between 3 and 4, we're going to get a ethyl radical and a propyl ion right but i want you to sit and look at it actually right i'm not sure if it's large enough for you guys to see the fact that there is a free electron right here so based on where you break it right you're gonna get different types of peaks and those different types of peaks are gonna be um well those different types of ions are gonna produce the peaks right and based on the data that you receive, you're going to see which peaks are more stable, right? We can predict which peaks are more stable because we know um, the stability of carbocations, right? So you can know which peaks are going to be more stable, right? And from the data itself, we can figure out, right, which peaks are most abundant, all right? So the mass of the radical species lost in fragmentation is the difference between the mass charge values of the fragment ion and the molecular ion itself. All right so just gonna have you guys have a look at this really the information to the fragments being formed right and what is being present on the graph and then you can ask some questions while you're looking at it all right go ahead so sir um why is uh the is it propel ion more stable why is it the most stable interesting yeah all right so we're looking at you're saying at 43 that would be the profile ion, right why is that the most stable thing okay could anyone provide an answer for that why would that ion be the most stable well be the most abundant in this case rather um most abundant most stable generally the same Right, but could anybody provide an answer for that? Why would that be the most or the most abundant? Uh, 
Alright. So I'm not hearing any answers as to why. Sorry, Go ahead. So like the... hmm. I was gonna say like the least is like the easiest to be rich to get. Mm -hmm. Like the lowest energy to be rich. Alright. So the lowest energy cleavage. All right. So let's have a look at this, right? There are five carbons. So let's have a look at five carbons, right? So one, two, three, four, five, right? So we're saying that the highest abundance is when we break here at pos at this position, right? As opposed to breaking here at this position. This is position one. This is position two. Right? If we break the molecule at position 1, what we're going to be getting is a methyl ion and a butyl ion. Right? Now, methyl ions are way less stable right, than if we were to break it at position 2 and produce an ethyl ion. Right? So, based on the fact that if you break it at position 1 right, and produce a butyl ion and a methyl ion, right, that would be much less favorable energetically favorable in the system than to actually break the bond at position two and produce an ethyl radical and a propyl radical right or ions rather i'm using the word um radical i should be saying ion my mistake right so ethyl ions and propyl ions in a solution right are in a space right is less energetically well it's more energetically favor favorable right rather than you actually producing methyl ions, right? So it is now in relation to the fact that it's not that the propyl ion itself is like more stable than all of them generally, right? But if you try to create a butyl um, ion itself, right? You lead to the production of a methyl ion, right? Which is not going to be present, right? Which is least favorite, which is least abundant, right? which is not gonna, the molecule is not going to want to cleave that way, right? So why the propyl um, ion is more present is because if we have a propyl ion, right, we can also have a relatively stable ethyl ion, right? And that would be a more energetically favorable cleavage, right? So it's the most energetically favorable cleavage of all of them, all right? So if we look at what's happening here, 72 is a molecular ion peak, right? 72 is a molecular ion peak. 57 here, we note that the butyl um, ion, right, would be the most more stable one, right? That would be more stable, right, somewhat, okay? But it's going to have a larger mass, right? It's more stable, right? But the fact that we created by creating a methyl ion right that cleavage itself overall is less energetically favorable than preferring this up here i'm not sure if you're if that's answering the question good enough joel is that fine yes sir it makes logical sense thank you all right so 72 molecular ion p 57 that would be the next one right that would be the butyl ion right 43 would be the propyl ion itself, right? And uh, we're gonna have 29, which is the ethyl, right? So what we're seeing here is that, what we're seeing here is that there is some molecule of a mass of 72 atomic mass units, right? That produces three more, three of the most stable substituents here, right? And then this would tell us that substituent 57 itself, right? Um, itself is not really as abundant as what is at 43 here right and 43 is way more abundant than what is at 29 right so we're looking at the fact that since position 2 breaking the molecule at position 2 is going to be more favorable right we're gonna naturally see more propyl ions and more ethyl ions right but we're gonna have a high abundance of propyl ions because that is more stable that is a more stable one in the arrangement or in the cleavage right that's going to be the more stable product so we're going to have that up there all other subsequent peaks right would be peaks containing isotopes of carbon so at peak 43 we're going to be seeing a propyl ion with carbon 12 and hydrogen 1 
right? That would be theoretically, well, theoretically carbon 12 and hydrogen 1 would be the only isotopes found, right? But why we're going to have something like 40, um, well, something else, right? We're going to probably have a different type of isotope. Let's say that it's, it's carbon, um, very rare, but carbon 11 or something, or up here, it's going to be carbon 13 or 14. Those isotopes are really, really rare. But this could exemplify the fact that different isotopes are present, right? Or the fact that it could be a more unstable ion, which really could be a propyl 2 plus ion or something like that, that will actually send it somewhere else, right? But what we're normally looking at is the stable fragments that are produced. That is what we're looking at for mass spec. So all other tiny little dots, we don't have to know all of that for our K, all right? Don't have to know all that, okay? All right, so let us have a move on in the interest of time, right? How do we distinguish between molecules now? So looking at this picture that I have right here, hopefully it's, it's readable, it's legible, right? Butane for part is uh, um, in A, right? And methylpropane is B, right? So we can see that they produce two distinct mass spectra, right? So they have the same molecular mass, however, right? But mass spectrometry can be used to distinguish between these molecules. So even though it's the same mass they possess in them, right? we can still figure out the difference between two things because they are structurally different. They are isotopes, okay? So notice the difference between the spectra 29, right? Um, for the mass charge ratio, right? So the difference here at 29 here and then there's really nothing going on at 29 here, right? Butane 29, right? So butane at that 29 mass charge ratio, that is due to this radical here, not the radical, the ion rather, right? So it's due to this ion here. And for the methyl propane, it has no peak at the 29, all right? So we can note that there are differences between these different um, substituents, right? So while the butane itself can produce this radical, based on how methyl propane is structured, it can't produce that radical. So you're gonna see difference in peaks where one molecule can create a fragment, but another molecule can't create a fragment, right? And that is why understanding isotopes is that interesting or that important, right? Because based on the structure, it will produce different types of peaks on the spectra, right? In butane, at the mass charge ratio of 43, right, is due to this radical, well, not this um, ion, right, that we can see here, right? But at 43 for the methylpropane, right, it's due to a different ion. Right? So what we're saying is that our different masses, right, are due to different types of fragments, right? And different fragments arise from the fact that they are structurally different. And that's what I'm trying to bring across in this slide. Not because it's mass spec means that all we do is look at mass and things that have the same mass will come up the same way. That's not how it works, right? If it's connected differently, we can break it in different ways, producing different types of fragments at different abundances. All right? So both molecules does have a molecular ion peak at 57 however, right? Well, 58 rather, because that would they would have the same mass, right? At that at those peaks. Okay? They would have roughly the same mass at those peaks. So both of them have a molecular ion peak at 57. 58 rather, right? So when two molecules themselves have the same molecular ion peak, we know that they have the same mass. But looking at the rest of the spectra, we can figure out whether or not they are, you know you know, the same, right? Or if they are different, if they're isotopes of each other, right? Or they're, or if they're completely different molecules, because we could have a ketone and an alkene, right? Just an example, we could have a ketone and an alkene that are the same mass, right? So we can't just look at the molecular ion peak to distinguish, we have to look at the rest of the entire structure, right? Or the entire spectrum, rather, all right? So that was just being able to distinguish molecules even though they have the same mass. All right, moving on to the next slide. So the M plus one peak, no. So the M plus one peak is due to the presence of the carbon 13 isotope. All right, 
So we can have that m plus 1 peak. Now we have m plus peak and m plus 1 peak. So let's look at this, right? So this peak is due to that carbon, carbon 13 isotope, right? The abundance of the carbon 13 isotope is 1.1, right? Percent of all carbon atoms. So the abundance of the M plus 1 peak in the ethanol spectrum is 1.1% of the abundance of the molecular of the molecular ion peak, right? So if you can look at this now, right? For carbon 12 in methane, right? It's going to have a slightly different peak than carbon 13 methane, right? So at M plus one peak for a regular methane, um, for a regular methane itself, right, or for a regular alkene itself, right, will contain carbon twelve molecules, right. But those tiny peaks that you see after, like this tiny peak that the arrow is leading at, right, could speak to the fact that it is also right a molecular ion peak of some sorts, right. But they have different isotopes, specifically of carbon with respect to the M plus 1 P, right? So carbon-13 isotopes are present to produce that P. So that little bump there, abundance of 2.9% in any organic compound, right? 1.1% of the carbon atoms are the isotope of carbon-13, right? So we can note that that isotope really brings up that kind of dot there on the graph, okay? So, all the other peaks that come after are due to different types of isotopes, usually heavier isotopes, right? Because those will have, you know, higher masses. All right. And mass increases going that way. So I have the regular molecular ion peak, but that tiny molecular ion peak, right? Is due to the fact that some carbon in this structure is not carbon 12, but carbon 30, right? And in this case, it would probably be all of them would be carbon-13 because it has a much larger mass compared to the carbon-12 um, variant. Okay, I'm not sure if that lost or that missed anyone. Is that fine? Okay, just drop some ones in the chat if you're following. If there's a question to be asked, ask the question. Right. Let me just check up on you guys. Let me see if anybody texted anything in the chat. All right, there's no questions in the chat. All right. So we have this here. Everything should be fine moving forward. This information down here is trying to work out, right, the number of carbons. Right. So in order to find the number of carbons n in a molecule, this can be very, 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 very useful. Right, because if they just tell you that it's an alkene or something like that, the simplest information that we can use to start figuring out what the molecule is is how much carbon in it. Right? So in order to find that note of carbons N, right? Note difference, right? Note the one point one percent right abundance and stuff like that, right? So 100 divided by 1.1 times the abundance of the M plus 1P divided by the abundance of the molecular ion peak M, right? That will give you the number of carbon atoms. Example, if the molecular ion peak has an abundance of 49.3% and the M plus 1P has an abundance of 3.8%, the number of atoms in the compound is 100, right? Divided by 1.1 times 3.8 divided by... 49.3 and that will give you seven carbon atoms present in the compound and you can move on with your life you need to be able to determine the number of carbon atoms in a compound that will help you to figure out what the molecule is right so you know you have seven carbon atoms you times that number of carbons by 12 and you subtract everything else from the mass you try to fill in hydrogen and if there's not enough hydrogen we can tell that there's a halogen or something else on the compound we're gonna get that all right the way how you really get into figuring out these compounds is through practice all right so the first step is to figure out go ahead so sir i was saying essentially it's just a trial and error just to see what um arrangement of molecules or atoms make up the molecular mass mm -hmm. 
Okay, that makes right. sense. So they are, they are, they are hypothesis. It's really not really hypothesis. It's a, it's a educated assumption, right? So let's give a scenario. Let's say that we have a car. We get an, a molecule, and we figured out through calculation that there are three carbon atoms present, right? Three times twelve, right, would give us thirty-six. So it's, that mass is thirty-six, right? So let's say that we minus, right? Let's say that we put hydrogens all around it, right? How many hydrogens can a three carbon compound hold? Can somebody answer me with that? How many hydrogens can a three carbon compound hold? Um, three carbon compound hydrocarbon yeah, yeah so right. a three hydro that would be seven seven right so a car a hydrocarbon with three carbon atoms can hold seven are we sh mm, hold on let me draw that out <laughs> let me draw that out real quick all right so if we get a, a value of three carbons right if I got a three carbons are present Right? Eight, 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 because I'm like seven, mm. right? Let's surround it by hydrogen specifically, right? This is the simplest compound that we can find for a three carbon compound, right? <laughs> and the mass of this, right? The mass is supposed to be what? Right? The mass of this is supposed to be 44, right? But let's say that the mass is actually 80, right? So we have three carbon compound, well, a third three carbon compound, right? With a mass of 80, right? How would we try to figure out what the structure is? We're going to have to draw out our three carbons. We're going to replace everything with hydrogen. We're trying to figure out how we can get that 80, right? So we could come up with the fact that, okay, probably there's a halogen on the compound right and that halogen could be chlorine 37 and then when you look at it and you replace one hydrogen with chlorine 37 then you get 80 so your presumption now your assumption now is that this is one chloropropane right so you really play with it right to figure out what the compound really is all right so let's continue. Just know to know, know to know that I ask you if there's one thing alone you understand, please know how to calculate the number of carbons within the compound. The equation is right here. Just let me know what I tell you. All right. So let's move on. All right. So a gift from me to you. Another question, right? The mass spectrum of a straight chain alkene is obtained where the molecular ion peak has a relative abundance of 12% and the mem plus peak has a relative abundance of 0.55%. Determine the number of carbon atoms in this compound, propose the molecular formula for this compound, propose the structural formula for this compound, and predict four major fragments along with the mass charge ratio values that would appear in the mass spectrum of this compound. Can you do it? Hmm. All right. So I want you guys to try to take a screenshot, right? Because we're not gonna do it in this session right now, right? We can probably try it in the WhatsApp group later, right? But I want you guys to try it, right? So try to propose a molecular form and everything like that for the compo, all right? Excuse me, sir. Can you explain the thing on this slide before one of them? On this slide? Yes, sir, because I'm, I'm not getting like the whole calculation because the saying is not related to the image on the right display. Oh, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. All right, so you're asking, let me just say no. It's not related to the image on the right at all, for real, because we're not really looking at the image on the right. We're just look, using a scenario to figure out, right, that a M plus one peak would actually be something containing carbon 13, right? So what we're saying is that if we're looking at methane, right, methane would have a mass of 16, a mass charge ratio also of 16, right? So if we have an M plus 1 peak, it would be carbon 13 methane at 17, right? What that means is that, remember the M plus 1 peak, 
would just be one over the mass really right it's basically m plus one right so we're adding to the mass right and the only way we can add something to the mass is if, if there is a heavier isotope right i remember what we spoke about in the m plus p right that slide we spoke about the fact that if there is something that is present after the m plus p it must be the compound itself with the presence of a heavier isotope so that's what it's really talking about right but in order to really um so that's what that bit is talking about right the fact that that m plus ion for methane would have been that so for this substance itself the m plus ion would have been probably an ethanol with a carbon 13 on it all right so m plus one p5 could be that all right but what the calculation is basically speaking about we're looking for the abundance right we're taking the abundance of carbon 13 specifically right we're using it to divide 100 and then times it by the abundance of the F m plus one peak and uh, um divided by the abundance of the molecular ion peak right and that's how we can find the number of carbon atoms within a compound itself all right so this is slightly different from what's up here right but what we're how we find the number of carbons we actually use the abundance of the carbon 13 isotope in order to find the number of carbons all right but i'm not sure if i answered your question if i didn't answer your question could you rephrase it oh uh, yes did. so like so that's how you get stuff that that has a higher mass to charge ratio it's basically just uh isotope of the molecular ion yeah it would be right and it has to uh, be yeah. yeah and it has to be really significant um really insignificant because if that m plus one peak was really really up there that would be our new molecular ion peak <laughs> because that would not make any sense right so the m plus one peak is usually really really small because the heavier isotopes are um will have a less abundance so it's usually a more insignificant tiny peak right after the molecular ion peak all right so this now hopefully everybody took a screenshot so you guys can have a go at answering this question all right and seeing how we can figure out um what a proposed compound here would be all right so moving to the m plus two peak some compounds produce a peak with a mass of two units heavier than the molecular ion this is called the m plus two peak this peak is present in the mass spectrum of compounds containing chlorine or bromine. All right. So this is speaking to our halogens now. The relative abundance of chlorine 37 in nature is 33% and that, and that of chlorine 35, right? Um, so that the mass spectrum of the compound containing chlorine atom produces an M plus 2 peak, right? So what we're saying is that chlorine 37 is two units heavier than chlorine 35. Therefore, we're going to have an M plus 2 peak right so that is one third right one third the relative abundance of the molecular ion peak all right it would be one third the abundance all right why because this is the ratio right the ratio of chlorine 35 to chlorine 37 is three to one therefore the m plus two peaks abundance is one third that of the molecular ion peak all right so it's similar to that of bromine in which natural abundance of bromine 81 is 98% right of that of of bromine 79 right therefore the mass spectrum of the compound containing bromine produces a m plus 2 peak that is almost equal to molecular ion peak right 81 to bro, bro, bromine 81 to bromine 79 would give us a 1 to 1 ratio right so it's almost equal we just roughly call it one to one right so we're gonna have that there so meaning that if we're gonna be looking at bromine's m plus two peak right the abundance is gonna be really close to the molecular ion peak but for chlorine now right it's going to be one third the abundance of the molecular ion peak all right so i'm just pausing so i don't go too fast all right, so brief pause there. Any questions?
Okay. So let's look at um, methyl chloride, right? So in methyl chloride here, now the mass spectrum of the compound is shown here, right? It would have two molecular ion peaks, right? A M peak and an M plus two peak. So notice how, right? At fifty, that would be our um our molecular ion peak that we're looking at, right? And then at uh, M plus two, now, right? That would be our peak for chlorine 37 ion being present right so hopefully it makes sense hopefully it's making the sense that we want it to don't look at the graph and say and talk about base peak or anything like that no it's just a graph to explain <laughs> the difference right we're actually zooming in on this part right to look at the difference between them so the m plus peak would be 50 here and then the m plus 2 peak right would be here how do we know it's m plus 2 first of all if the mass is 50 right and the other peak um after it is 52 and we're having chlorine present we know that this m plus one peak right sorry not the m plus one peak, this m peak right would actually be containing chlorine 35 right so any other peak coming after must contain chlorine 37 right and it is two um units larger than 50 so it's going to be 52 and the abundance itself is only one third of the m peak of the molecular ion peak right therefore it's gonna be around you know one third of the line itself or the abundance itself right so this is how we can clearly see right the m plus two peak right i'm just trying to make sure that i'm not going too far out of the scope of the syllabus because the syllabus does say to refer to m plus peaks and m plus one peaks and m plus two peaks all right so looking at it right so this is 50 and 52 is everything fine so far is everything okay so far guys is, did i hmm. I'm not sure if there's any. Is everyone okay? Is everyone okay? Okay. I want to make sure that you guys are still breathing. Okay. <laughs> Digesting it. Okay. It does take a while. All right. It's it's different from the other parts of chemistry that we've been looking at. All right. So what we're saying is that here, it's if we do the calculation right chlorine 35 so we have 35 plus the three hydrogen so we plus three plus the carbon which is plus 12 that should give us 50 right so that would be the mass of the oh my gosh that would be the mass of the peak that we're seeing here 50 right so this 50 is a result of the 12 the one carbon right plus the three hydrogen plus chlorine 35 right so if we see 52 now that means that we're containing something that is two units above right what should be seen at the m plus the m peak right so what's happening here is that is either two extra hydrogens there right or we have two carbon 13 but those things would be way less probable than there just being a different isotope of chlorine which would be our chlorine 37 right those are, those other things are way more probable if the 52 was made up by let's say two carbon 13 isotopes it would be such a tiny peak right it may not be visible because that's gonna be really really rare there right so the more probable one remember we're looking at we're also looking at abundance right so some people may say that oh it could be two other isotopes it could be two deuterium atoms it could be some other mass that created a difference no 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 that other mass will not have an abundance as high as this right so it most, the most probable one would be chlorine 37 causing the issue here causing it to be bumped up by two all right so let's have a look at this now our our ethyl bromide right so the m plus peak here right you can see the m plus peak way up here that molecular ion peak right and that's due to this ion right with the presence of bromine 79 which is our most um abundant bromine and then let's look at the other peak here the m plus 2 peak really really close right and that is caused 
caused by our bromine 81 right and we spoke about the fact that the the abundance of the of the bromine 79 is about 98 percent abundance right not 79 81 is 98 percent abundant right so it's gonna be really really close in ratio it's roughly a one-to-one -one ratio therefore the m plus and m plus two peaks for bromine will be really really close right hopefully that makes sense the abundances are gonna be really close for chlorine it's not gonna be really close but for bromine it is all right is that fine guys Guys, oh, yes, yes. Yes. all right lovely that's making sense okay okay go ahead no question yeah i used i used to think that the um that the m plus one and m plus two peak are just like any peaks after the m plus two so like the first two but it's making sense. okay so m plus one peaks are caused by derivatives of carbon but our M plus 2 peaks are caused by derivatives of usually halogenic isotopes, right? It's usually halogens, right? We usually at unit 2 relate M plus 2 peaks to halogens because we're speaking about mainly our halogen alkenes, halogen alkenes, etc., right? Um, in this case, let me just briefly scope, scroll through your syllabus just a second, right? Um, yeah, so a brief description of the M plus 2 peak. We're usually talking about halogens here. Alright? I'm trying to make sure that I'm sticking to the script of your syllabus. Alright? But any outside information would just be helpful information. Alright? So it's that. Okay, let's have a look at this now. What happens with two chlorine atoms or two bromine atoms? What happens if both two are present? Right? So if there are two chlorine atoms present, right? Um right we're gonna have you know chlorine um m plus peak and chlorine well we're gonna have a chlorine m plus peak and a chlorine m plus two peak right we're gonna have a bromine m plus peak and a bromine m plus two peak so let's see what's happening here compounds containing two chlorine or two bromine atoms right which are usually our molecular bromine and molecular chlorine will produce m plus two peaks along with an m plus four peak the ratio of an M, M peak to an M plus 2 peak to an M plus 4 peak, right, is given here, 96 to 1, right, for dichloro compounds, right, so if a dichloro compound is going to be 96 to 1, all right, so this, that's really what we're having a look at. On the diagram here is actually a bromine compound being shown here, the chlorine compound is right here, I'm going to show it to you, right, so let's actually look at the chlorine compounds, 96 to 1 for the abundance right so we're gonna have this molecular ion peak and then we're gonna have two smaller ones right we're gonna have different ones there so it's a nine to six to one now when we're looking at those types of relations oh sorry it's here nine to six to one my apologies right so it's gonna be nine six to one right those abundances right that's what happens when we have two chlorine right because when we have two chlorines, we increase the degree of freedom, all right? What do I mean by that? We increase the possibilities, right? So if we have one chlorine atom in the compound, right? There's only the possibility that it's either chlorine 35 or chlorine 37, right? I want you guys to follow me on this. Is that right? If there's only one chlorine in the compound, there's only the possibility that it's chlorine 35 or chlorine 37, right? Yes, sir. All right. But when you have two chlorines in the compound, there are three possibilities. It could be that the two chlorines are chlorine 35, or both of them are chlorine 37, or one could be 35 and 37. So one could be 35 and one could be 37. So there are three different possibilities leading to completely different groups, leading to an M plus group, an M plus two group, and an M plus four group, right? So the M plus four group is not really shown um, on the Cape syllabus, so we're not going to really get into that, right? But it's in a 96 to 1 ratio. And just a quick side note, why I find this so interesting is that this is similar, right, to genetics, right? Not gonna really talk about it much, but it's similar to the p-test that Mendel that um, Mendel did, 
it's giving the same difference right the same abundance right um as it would in biology so i think it's like a weird connection but 96 to 1 for the abundance there right and let's look at here the figure here now for the for dibromomethane right we're gonna have m m plus 2 and m plus 4 peak same thing right so we're gonna have m m m plus 2 and m plus 4 right but for this now, it is way more likely that a 81 and a 87 exists than just a 87 and than a, well, there's more way more likely that an 81 and an 87 bromine atom atoms exist together rather than 81 by itself and 79 by itself, right? So notice that the m plus two peak would be higher than both other peaks, right? It is an anomaly for bromine, right? So uh, for chemistry, we have to highlight these anomalies, all right? So we have that there, right? So for bromine, if we have two bromines to compound, the M plus two peak is gonna be higher than the M plus, right? And the M plus four peak, all right? So that's just some information there. So let's move on actually. Um, are there any issues so far? These are just things to remember, by the way, right? These are just things to remember, okay? So that is really it there. Not sure if there are any questions or concerns, but I'm sure you guys will ask me if you have any questions. All right, so we have these different peaks here. So notice how we have chlorine in its M plus peak here, M plus two, right? And M plus four peak down here. For bromine, we have M plus peak here. M plus two is larger than all of them, and M plus four peak is right here, all right? Any other tiny substituents you see down there are derivatives of carbon. They're M plus 1 peaks. Just note that. They're all derivatives of carbon. Any tiny abundance of we saw down there. All right? So let's look at this now. All right? So we spoke about this a lot. So we have an M plus peak here, right? Parent peak. We have the base peak, which obviously is 100% intensity, right? Basic spectra that we normally look at. All right? So it's coming back to something that looks a little bit more familiar. Alright, so let's go through identifying peaks now. Alright, so before we move on, I want to know if everything before was fine, everything before is okay, I need to ask. Is everything fine so far, people? It is an interestingly um, complex topic. But the thing about complex topics is that they're rather easy. Alright, complex doesn't mean hard right so it's just that it's a bunch of simple information right but the fact that the fact of the matter is that it's complex it's like weaved into these intricate structures right so it's a bit hard to get into but once you understand it everything should be fine all right so let's get into identifying different types of peaks so we need to know that alkyl peaks themselves right are really really similar right and the mass spec due to alkyl peaks are really important Majority of the compounds that we're going to be looking at have alkyl peaks, right? Obviously, because they're going to have carbon containing compounds, they're going to have alkyl peaks, right? So, these are some things that you could memorize as well, right? So, for the methyl ion, it's going to have a mass of 15. The ethyl ion is going to have a mass of 29. The propyl ion is going to have a mass of 30, 40, 43, rather, right? 57 is going to be for our butyl. Our pentyl is going to be 71, and our hex, our phenyl, right? Our hexyl, our phenyl, right, is gonna be 77, all right? So we have that there. These are our peaks here, all right? The masses for the different types of peaks. So if you see an organic compound that is an alkane, alkene, whatever it is, and you see a peak at 15, you must remember that it's a methyl ion. If you see a peak at 57, best believe that is a butyl peak, right? So memorizing these type of things can help you to figure out what ions are present at the different peaks, okay? So that's why they're really, really, really important. All right. So let's have a move on. This is just a table to memorize. You're going to get the slide. It's fine. All right. So let's look at this now. Alkanes, right? So molecular ion peaks are usually present, but with a low intensity. So peaks are usually 14 units apart. Why, are they ten why do they tend to be 14 units apart? Let me explain briefly. Go ahead. Oh, you go ahead. Oh, never mind. Never mind. It's all right. You go ahead, sir. No, I want to hear what you have to say. 
No, I was going to say that because of this, it will be a difference in CH2. Lovely. We get difference in CH2. All right. So that is the whole reason why it's going to be different apart, right? Because if you're going to break molecules that are, are alkenes themselves, right? They're going to remember that alkenes are like this, right? If you're going to be breaking them, they're going to always be breaking off in CH2s and that mass is 14. Therefore, it will always be 14 units away, right? So lovely, right? Brilliant. Um, what's I'm talking? I never hear the answer. Oh, why they're 14 units away? Because when we create, when we break them off, right, carbon fragments, the carbon usually breaks off with two hydrogens. So we're losing 14 mass units, right? So we're using, we're losing the carbon and two hydrogens. So it's going to be 14 units apart. All right? Because one carbon and two hydrogen adds up to 14. So each time we lose that, right? we get a different peak at a different area. So it's 15 plus 14 will give us a 29, 15, 29 plus 14 should give us a 43, etc. Right? So we're actually breaking it down, losing 14 as we move going down. Alright? So that's that. So identifying the alkene, right? It says to identify alkene, right? Identify the, right, the alkene rather, right? Assigning ions to peaks 15, 29, and 43. Alright? So this is asking for you to identify the alkene, all right? It's actually a question. So you could take a screenshot of it if you keep, if you would like to, and have a go at identifying which alkene this is. All right. So have a go at that. That should be fine. All right. So hopefully, persons who want to do it took the screenshot. So I want to actually hear your answer to that. All right. So alcohols no. The molecular ion peak is almost non-existent, right? Cleavage usually occurs at the carbon to carbon bond next to the OH group, right? So usually cleavage happens like that on our alcohols, right? So we're gonna have that molecular ion peak and then the next peak itself will be due to a loss of water, right? Right, it tends to be that, right? So it tends to be the break, the breaking at that OH group there, right? That tends to give us these lower substituents, right? So this is this is talking about an oxygen with two hydrogens, right? So that type of group there. So if we break it there, right, we're gonna get 41, right, from this type of alkene. So we just have the loss there. So if we break the OH group, we're going to get that, right? But we usually have breaks at the carbon to carbon bond nearest to OH group, right? So if we're given an alcohol and we're given the structure of the alcohol, right? We have to know where is most convenient yes. to create our fragments. Because some people sit down with the molecule and break it anywhere they want. That's not how it works, right? But other compounds like alkenes and alkenes, you can break it anywhere you want. That's fine, right? But when we start adding in functional groups now, you have to look at the bonds that are most likely to break to create your most likely fragment, right? So we're looking at the cleavage is most likely to occur there. Alright? Giving different mass to charge ratios. So it's not like alkanes where every 14 we have a P. No. It's different. Alright? For aldehydes, no, they're gonna be a little bit different. So the base peak is usually present due to loss of R. CHO group, right? This is due to the cleavage of the R to CHO bond. For our aldehyde, we know that the carbonyl bond is located at the end of a chain. Therefore, what we're talking about is we're speaking about the bond here, right? It usually cleaves here. So we're losing this CHO here. We're losing that. So an aldehyde, right? In an aldehyde, the important peak is due to the R plus ion right for from the loss of the ch group right so we're gonna have our m plus peaks etc right and then we're gonna have the loss of um our different groups going forward right so our next huge peak is gonna be due to loss of our ch well our cho group rather right so we're gonna have the different types of abundances based off of what's happening here so our major peak is going to be what happens here, right? So this ion, this 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, this 
pento ion here. All right. Everything else is a substituent of that, right? So what we're basically saying here, you know, is that after we lose the CHO group, every other substituent after is going to be 14 apart because what we're doing is just dealing with an alkane. So we're going to be breaking it, differing by CH2 after that. Right, so that's how aldehydes are treated, right? Um, I haven't seen a pass paper with aldehydes before or alcohols before, right? If you guys have, let me know because we have to do pass paper questions relating to topics like mass spec. All right, I'm gonna put them in the group and then discuss them. But why I'm not really going into this in depth is because I haven't seen questions like this before, all right? But the information is still there, and you guys are gonna get the information after, all right? So this is another mass spectrum of the aldehyde here, right, for butanol. So the M plus peak is 72 for butanol. Here's the M plus peak here for butanol. Um, present there. M plus peak for butanol, right? The peak 43 is due to the R plus. So the peak at 43, right, over here is due to the R plus. So notice that there's a huge jump due to loss of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, that group there. Is lost so we and that group is 29 right so it's 72 minus 29 gives us 43 right so the next major group will be our 43 right our group at 43 so hopefully that makes sense what we're saying is that the major substituent in the aldehyde right will be our R plus group meaning that we have to minus 29 from the mass and that group no that mass will be our next important piece Make sense? Is that making sense to you guys? To repeat, which one would be the, the molecular ion again? Alright, so our molecular ion, right, itself will be... Okay, we're looking at butanol, right? So our molecular ion would be yes, our butanol. So C3H, um, that would be H7O. Mm -hmm. Would that be it? For butanol, what is the structure of butanol? Um, I think you can just add it in, maybe add it in, yeah. Alright, so looking at something like that, right? What's happening is that we're actually losing, um, this is actually not what we're gonna have. Let me just use an example, right? Let me not use butanol per se, but that looks wrong. Um, <laughs> so it looks wrong. So let me just use something like this. Let's use R, C, O, O. H, right let's look at that right so if we're dealing with butanol we know that the r is the entire of the butyl substituent right or the propyl substituent rather right what's gonna happen for aldehydes they break at this bond they break leave leaving out this substituent right so our entire molecular ion would be all of this you know right that would be at the molecular ion peak but our next peak would be our R group alone because we lose our functional group. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. So our next important peak would be the peak after we lose our functional group. And then ever every other important peak would differ by 14 because that would just be a regular R group, regular alkane. So you can always just break it apart, removing 14, right? So with aldehydes now, after you get your main mass, you minus 29, which is our C, our O, and our H combined, right? And then you start looking at the substituent groups going down. And that is how you actually write your ions. Because so that's how you can tell different ions with different peaks. All right? So that's how aldehydes work. For alkyl and acyl peaks now, right? We're going to have, they're actually really similar. So, looking at your acetyl, your propanil, your butyl, your pentyl, and your benzoyl um, groups, right? They're going to be um, similar, right? Their ions are going to be producing similar masses. So, we know our acyl groups. These are from our acids, our esters, or our acyl chlorides, our acyl, well, not acyl chlorides, but our acyl halides, right? They're coming from those. And there are alkyl groups are just regular alkyl groups that we saw, saw before, right? So these are relating, right? They're, yeah, you have relations between them and the masses, right? 
so you don't mix it up because if you're dealing with an alkyl compound or a type of carbonyl compound right that is like this right if we have the creation of an alkyl group or a acyl group right it's important not to mix them up per se right but we're gonna understand we're gonna have examples looking at what why do we have to look at these and what do we mean by this all right so if we're looking at something like a ketone right the mass spectra of ketones usually contains peaks due to the cleavage of carbon carbon bond next to the carbonyl carbon right so we can either have a split here or a split here right makes sense so we can either have r plus peaks right right or we can have the entire r c o p hoping that people are following right or we could have r1 plus peaks right the one is just to show the difference between one side chain and the other right or i could have this peak or one r1 plus co peaks right so what we're saying is that the molecule itself can break in multiple ways is either we can have this peak alone or we can have that peak with the functional group or we can have this peak alone right or that peak with this functional group attached right so it's just looking at the different ways in which you can break hopefully is that that was clear if it's unclear let me know was that unclear yes sir so it was a bit unclear all right so if we break the molecule here let's call this r1 if we break the molecule here we're gonna get an r plus right and we're gonna get an r1 co plus right so we're gonna get those two peaks because we break the bond there but if we break the bond right here right we're gonna get a rco plus and we're gonna get r plus r1 plus make sense so it's based on where we break the bond right so we're gonna have a r plus peak we're gonna have a r1 plus peak we're gonna have a rco plus peak i'm gonna have a r1 co plus peak, right based on where we break the ketone it's all based on where we break the ketone and based on mass spec mass spec is going to break all of them in all of these varying ways therefore we're gonna have all of these types of peaks present right it may be easier to be seen between like using like different letters between r and r1 but what we're saying is just that one alkyl group and the other alkyl group the r group or the r1 group right we can have different peaks based on how we break the alkene not the alkene rather the ketone all right so looking at something like this now right we can look at something like this so the molecular ion peak 72 right so we can see this this is the m plus peak here right we know it's the most abundant one over here everything to the right of the m plus peak would be due to different types of carbon isotopes right so that, those would be the m plus one peaks that we don't care about all right our parent peak over not our parent peak but our base peak over here highest abundance lovely we see that base peak right there right and all other peaks right we can tell the ions due to all other peaks right or they are coming from all other peaks so the largest peak is coming from the ch3 co plus ion right so you can see that there so that is coming from hold on that's not the eraser right so that is coming from that peak there right so we're looking at the masses as well you know right the mass will tell there right if we're gonna have a heavier mass there we're gonna have the c2h5 co plus group there right and then all other smaller groups would just be alkyl groups right because obviously if we're gonna have 29 if we remember the table that would be our ethyl substituent and if we're gonna have 15 right that 15 would be our alka our methyl substituent right 
So we have that theory. So this would be R29, and then that would be R15. Let me draw the R a little bit better. All right, that would be there. This would be here, all right? And that's how we really categorize it, all right? So basically, you know, what we can see here, let's call this R, and let's call this R1, right? So here in the at the peak at the peak of 57, right over here, right? We could call this one, right, the R1CO plus group. Hopefully we can see that, right? I'm trying to make the distinction, right? At R43 peak, that is our RCO plus group. Right? And then at 29, that is our R1 plus group. And then our last group would be our R plus group. Does that make sense? That makes sense, right? Because all we're doing is looking at the different groups at the, at the at both sides of the carbonyl group, all right? Showing that these different substituents are the important substituents for ketones, right? For aldehydes, right, they would just be regularly um, either our R plus and our RCO um, H plus group, right? That would be fine for them, right? But for ketones, now it can be broken in different ways to give these four main groups that we can look at. Does that make sense, guys? Sir, can you read that statement? What we're saying, right? What we're looking at is the important groups for ketones, right? Because ketones can be broken, right, in the, to create four different fragments, right? Right, we're just looking at the four major fragments and how they can and how they arise, right? So what we're looking at, why we call it a RCO plus and a R1CO plus, those things are just to really show us, right, which group, which side of our carbonyl bond is there, right? So if we have a carbonyl bond like this, right, right, this is the R side, this is the R1 side, right? It's just a R and R1 is just to distinguish between our methyl group in this case and our ethyl group in this case, right? So it's either we can have an ethyl group by itself, or ethyl group co combined with our carbonyl group, or we can have a methyl, or we, or we can have a methyl group by itself, or a methyl group combined with our carbonyl group, right? And these all are molecular ions. All right, sir. All right. I'm asking everyone. No, is everyone fine so far? Like it takes a little bit of concentration to get it, of course. Are these in the formula sheet? For uh, I don't remember actually. Hopefully somebody can send them a formula sheet in the WhatsApp group. But hopefully this is making sense. Tanika, Sumira, Kenesha, Victoria, Sanola. Does this make sense to you guys? But if it does make sense, you know, I can go over it. Right? It's just going to take a lot of time. Right? But it's just showing the important branches of for ketones. Right? So let's look at this. Esters now using the example of ethyl ethanoate. Esters usually produce relatively weak molecular ion peaks. Therefore, if, we, if I use my pointer now, look at the molecular ion peak here. Really, really tiny, really, really small. Relatively weak peaks. Right? Um, our RCOOR1 right, group. Right, that would be there. But the P that would basically be our molecular ion peak because that is the ester overall, right? So our peaks that, that are now present now are R plus peak, our RCO peak, and our R1 plus peak, right? So we could look at that. So if it's ethyl ethanoate, right, we can write out the compound, we can assign which one is R and which one is R1. And we can look at the different compounds, right? We can look at what's happening, right? So we should be able to assign the different peaks to the different masses that should occur, right? And I'm gonna leave you guys to do that. So if you guys, if anybody who is interested in being in practicing how to assign them, you can screenshot this and then assign them on your own and let me know your answers. Let me know what you come up with, all right? 
So we're just looking at how we can as break up these compounds and how we can assign them. Because I'm pretty sure Cape can ask you a question, right? By giving you a compound, giving you the spectra and asking you what ion is there at 43, right? They can ask you that and it's a very valid question, all right? So aromatic compounds, benzoic acid is our example here, right? This is just looking at our one of our compounds that we look at the most um, important peak here would be our M plus peak that we can see over here, right? And then the other peaks that we'll see is just our um, phenyl group, right? Our phenyl ion, right? Along with our, um, our regular phenyl cation, along with our phenyl ion attached to our carbonyl group, right? So this would be our phenyl ion attached to our carbonyl group, and this would just be our phenyl ion. And everything else, right, will be substituents from the phenyl ion. All right. But I note that you guys don't really have a look at aromatic compounds and complex compounds like that. So this is just extra information. All right. So this should be fine so far. All right. Our amines are a bit different as well. Our amines are broken, right, differently, right? So our ion peak is going to be an odd number. Obviously, because nitrogen itself is going to be give us our odd number there, right? And our peak is usually present due to loss of our methyl amine group, right? So our methyl amine group will be removed. So what we're basically saying here is similar to the alcohol, right? Our molecular ion peak would be everything right here at 73. But our next important peak would be the loss of our methyl amine group, which is value 30. So we minus 30 from 73. That is the next peak that we should be seeing. All right. So the next peak we should be seeing is this group here because we we removed the one methyl group and an amine group to give us that thirty there, that peak there at thirty. Okay, and that would be the most abundant ion. For a lot of these other um, complex um, compounds, usually the next important group is usually the base. All right. So what we're going to be doing is losing methyl ion, um, not methyl ion, methyl amine to give us our next important peak for our amines. All right. So that's what's happening there for our amines. I didn't even bother to go into amines and stuff like that. I think that would be too complex for the scope of Cape. All right. Well, it's really, it's really simple. It's literally the same thing as amine, but um, never really put it there. All right. So I don't think Cape would do that to you. So that's really it for mass spectrum right for mass spectrometry and i have just a bit of questions here um it's the same type of i think it's the same question from before no it isn't this is different yeah so this is a different question here right identify two ways in which data from mass spectrum can be used right explain the meaning of the following terms so we must be you guys must be able to define a mass charge ratio we must be able to define the m plus one peak the m plus peak and the base peak if so you need to also be able to define the m plus two peak you must be able to give us definitions of those right number three some of the peaks in the mass spectrum for the com, com the compound butan tool has a master charge ratio of 74 59 45 29 and 15 so just the identity of the species responsible for these peaks so this is the type of question that I said before that they might ask you. They might give you a compound, give you a peaks and ask you, oh, at peak 59, draw the, stru the structure of the ion. Now you must be able to give us the structure of the ion, right? So yet again, I must give you guys the benefit of the doubt, right? Though, because it is a really challenging topic for some persons, right? But it takes some practice, right? So in this case, now you already have the compound. You don't, know, don't need to find the number of carbons. You already know that, right? You just need to know how our alcohol breaks, right? To give us the different groups, right? We need to know our M plus peak. And from that, we can break the alcohol properly, right? And then from there, we can give us our different substituents, right? So I want you guys to try the, these questions in the PowerPoint, right? Send answers in the WhatsApp group, right? We all can discuss what the answers may be. All right. So if you have a past paper as well, you can send the past paper um, question, right, in the WhatsApp group, and we'll go through it. But that is really it for mass spectrometry, right? I went out of my way to include as much information as possible.
to help us clear up what an M plus 2 and M plus 1 peak are because those are usually where the issues come in as well as how to really find the number of carbons within a compound from when we know the number of carbons right we must be able to figure it out all right but that is essentially it another thing even though we went through reading these graphs and stuff like that the question that might come may just be understanding how a mass spectrometer works so we need to keep in mind that we need to know how it works right vaporization ionization acceleration deflection and detection right it always goes in those steps right but essentially that is it for mass spectrometry are there any questions or concerns